That's how we own it. What's up, family? It's your girl, Tamika D. Mallory. And it's your boy, my son, the general. And we're your host of Street Politicians, the, the place, place where the streets, streets and, and politics, politics meet. meet. What's up, my You know what? what? I was literally on my phone, minding my business, on my vacation. You see, there's a such thing in this world as a vacation. For who? And I'm on it right oh. now. But Look. you know, I'm doing I'm committed to one thing, which is that we tape our show no matter what. Um, but I'm on vacation. And I've been trying to stay off of the damn internet with the damn American crisis that is of every damn thing. Because it's it's a crisis over here and over here and over here and over here and over here, over here, over here, over here. But I couldn't help but notice that Jackson, Mississippi has no water. So, you know, when you get to the point where there's no water, right? And we know for years, the mayor, Chokwe Lumumba, who we love, that's our brother, has been sounding the alarm about infrastructure needs He's been denied funding to deal with some real serious infrastructure problems there. There's some new, uh, I think it might be a congresswoman. I have to look it up. She's either a congresswoman or a senator uh, that is there also who uh, voted against the Build Back Better plan and infrastructure. So she's just one of those people who's anti-everything. I haven't even looked her up, but I promise you she's a Republican. I promise you. I already know. I mean, I'll go look it up because, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm just saying it speaks to your theory of what you've been talking about week after week that we want. This is why we have to build our own party and run our own candidates, because at this point, you got one party of people who at least they'll vote for the right things. But a lot of times, too many of them are too weak to push for transformative change. They just want to keep patching stuff up. And then you got another side of people who just obstructionists completely. So it's just a disaster. Yeah. But there have been, uh, but Chokwe, um, Mayor Lumumba, and others have been fighting for funding to deal with pipes, to deal with water lines, sewage lines, all of that has not been dealt with. And so it's gone from a little bit of water water issues to no running water at all. You can't drink it, you can't wash with it, nothing. The schools have been closed, government buildings, businesses have been, now we just came out of COVID, the businesses cannot afford to be shut down. People in their homes have no water. This is a disaster. How does this happen in America? We had Flint, the Flint water crisis in Newark, at some point there was infrastructure issues and different places around the country, I think even in St. Louis. So it's not just in the two places we've heard of, but now Jackson, Mississippi has lost all of their water. What is the coach's name? Um, Dion, Dion, Dion Sanders. Sanders. So he's the coach of the college, right? Yep. He has to move his students off, you know, outside of Jackson somewhere, the 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 uh, athletes because they don't have water to take a shower. They have no water at all, not to eat with, not to brush their teeth or anything. That is crazy in the city of Jackson. This is outrageous. That is unbelievable to me that in the twenty first century <laughs> that we have we don't have water, running water. In, in in the state is like it just doesn't even make sense to me and, and 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 there's no real understanding of it it's no real understanding it's just that you know we live in this capitalist society where everything costs money and you paying for this and people can't get the basic necessities of running water but the people are paying because Today, I haven't had the opportunity because I'm on vacation, but I am going to go do some more research because now, you know, until Freedom, Woke Vote, and others are starting to get together to see what we can do to help. And in my research, the, the small little bit of research I did today before coming on the show, people's water bills are super high. 
So folks have been paying their bills. Some people haven't because they weren't getting the proper water treatment, but most people are paying their water bills. And for what? Like it should never get to the point where the system has to be shut down completely. And of course, the governor and other officials have water tanks outside their house, trucks out there feeding them water. The fire department does not have water to fight a fire. Like this is very serious. And the, you know what really just shook me today? And this, and actually, I was so busy reading and trying to understand, and I was getting into little details. And what it it just kind of like struck me was the 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 idea of what the hell is happening in Parchment Prison and other places where we already have had to help them, the the incarcerated individuals, fight for their rights to clean food, to, you know, uh, uh, toilets that work, to all of the, the inhumane things that they were fighting against. Now they don't have water. What, so what does that, so they don't take baths, they, they're, they're to, their commodes that they have to be in the same room with are full of feces. It's not like anybody's going to bring them cases of water and pack and, and put Poland Spring in the, in the well, just water, because I support just water by my little brother, Jaden Smith you know, Jada Pinkett and Will Smith's um, son. Um, but anyway, no one's going to bring cases of just water. Well, Jaden actually would bring cases of just water, but they won't even let it in to the jails because it's not authorized. I mean, it's just so many things about the system that's all over the place. Yeah. I don't know. Some days I just don't know. And you probably never will, man. My grandmother said the realest shit ever. She said, she said, some things you'll never, it's a whole world. My mother told her one day, she said, I don't get it, man. I don't understand. And she said, you think it build a whole world over things you don't understand. And I realized right now, this is the world they built. Because I don't sorry. understand none of this. Because it just makes no sense whatsoever. So anyway, anyone who's listening and watching, find some organizations, particularly folks in Jackson, Mississippi, local groups, that are doing, um, you know, relief work to get. Of course, I haven't heard. Maybe, maybe by the time I get, we get off of here and we check out the news, FEMA will be there or some in government entity that'll be there to help people. But um, that wasn't the case uh, earlier this th today. So you know, find people to plug in with and make sure you support them and help them in any way that you can. Rakia Lumumba. Uh, who works, who is the mayor's sister, but she works on her own as an organizer in the city of Jackson. She's someone that folks should tap Ruru. into. Rukia Lumumba, check Ruru. in with her and help her, you know, help them to do what it is that they need to do. The Mississippi, uh, what is it called? The Mississippi Prison Reform Coalition, even though they work specifically with the prisons, and I'm sure they're going to be looking at relief measures for parchment and other prisons, but those individuals are activists and organizers leading in Jackson all over, and you should tap in with them and see how you can support groups that are working to get water to the residents of Jackson. Definitely. So I was looking in the news, and um, you know there's been this whole thing ever since Young Thug and, and the other guys been down with this indictment. The, the prosecutor, the lead prosecutor in Atlanta, um, I believe she made another um, sweep of arrests, about 16 more individuals that she says gang affiliated and they're responsible for home invasions and robberies and all types of things. And they asked, some of them actually are rappers and she said that they would be using the lyrics in the songs that they made to prosecute them. And a lot of people are angry, saying that hip hop is under attack and that you can't use lyrics. And she said one of the most simplest shit in the world. She said, you know, hip hop is not under attack. If you are doing crime and we investigating you for the crimes and you put said crimes into raps, describing that you've done them we are going to see it as a confession you are telling me yourself we're going to utilize that along with your case 
Now, if you don't want to do it, then don't rap about it. And if you do want to rap about it and you don't want it to, to be prosecuted and it be utilized against you, then you should probably leave my county. And that was the real issue. To me, it's just like, I, you know, we've all been young, we've been dumb, and I, and I try not to be critical because I'm a child of hip hop. I was one of the most hard rappers in the late 90s. You know, I, most of my lyrics were so hardcore and, and could, because that was my reality. And most of us had our reality. But what we understood was you can't talk about crimes that's actually been committed or being committed, right? Especially when you're involved in them. And if you do, they're going to utilize it. You know, so I tried not to, to be critical, but I just think that it's, it's asinine. You know, and the district account, I mean, the district attorney's name is Fannie Willis in Fulton County. But I think it's asinine to think that you can literally rap about crimes and the police are not going to do their job. They have whole task force that they utilize for Instagram and Facebook and all of that. Like they have whole units inside police stations now that are, are that's, they're geared strictly for to decode, you know, the, the, the words, the, the slang inside hip hop, all of these things. So I, I'm, I'm definitely against, you know, silence of the, um, First Amendment right, the right to speech and, and all those things, freedom of speech. But if you, freedom of speech says you can say what you want. It doesn't say that if you say what you, if you admit to a crime, that they're not going to utilize that freedom of speech against you. You can say whatever you want. You can, you, you can say whatever. You go outside and say, yo, I killed such and such in 85. Right? You know, the, the, the Constitution does not protect that statement from connecting you to the body that somebody lost in 85 that they could connect you to. It does not protect you against that. So I think it's asinine that we have these conversations. You know, I, I wish a lot of our young youth and hip hop artists just get away from it, man. You know, I think, you know, the time of really promoting violence, not, not just having entertainment because sometimes is a balance, negative and positive. Sometimes you talk about negative things. Sometimes we have negative realities. Some songs, uh, you know, have negative um, situations in them. We talked about things you would do to your worst enemies, hypothetical situations, but putting real life beefs in, in ways that people have been harmed, lives have been taken into songs. At this point, it's pointless and it's gonna get you locked up. You know, I, I would- Let me ask this question. How would you respond to somebody who says, oh, my son, I, and I also heard uh, DJ Envy and Charlemagne talking about the same thing. How would you respond to artists or people who are listening to you speaking right now? And they're like, oh, so you saying that I committed the crime just because I spoke, you know, I said something in my lyrics. So you you supporting, you know, the, the, the ops, the, the cops coming for us. How would you respond to that? How would you respond to somebody who's even going to say that, you know, you're, 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 you are um, co-signing, arresting these big entertainers, little guys, whatever they are, under, because of their lyrics, are you saying you agree with her that everybody who's saying it is doing it as well? No, what, I, what I'm saying is, I, I'm totally against you taking someone's lyrics as, as evidence in chief, meaning the only evidence you have is that I, I rapped about a situation that you can't even prove happened, right? That's the only evidence you have. There's no other connection. So that right there is just utilizing lyrics against me. But if I'm in the streets, you have a video of me coming out of a building, right? with somebody just got shot. I got on all black. I jump into a black car. I drive off. Boom, they come in, they do the investigation. People seeing me. Some of the intel says that I was the person and I make a song, say, yeah, I ran in the building, I shot him. Jumped in my black Jeep and I drove off. Niggas don't want no beef with me. If you did that, right? I think that's the dumbest shit in the world. Even if you didn't do that crime, I'm not even talking about that crime. Even if I witnessed that crime, even if I was just uh, there witnessed it, I, I was around that situation. To talk about a crime that I can actually be connected to, 
that actually happened, that they have other evidence that connects me to the people who committed those crimes is the dumbest shit in the world. It makes no sense to me. You know what I'm saying? But if you just if you just trying to convict me purely on lyrics that I said, but you don't got no other evidence that even puts me near the scene of crime that connects me to anything that has to do with it, then that's, that doesn't make sense. Now you just prosecute me based on entertainment, based on words that I said. But when you understand that you are connected if you if your man caught a body or your man shot somebody and you were standing there and you watched it and you rapped about it <clears throat> now it's a at that point you we already see you there at the scene of the crime we got you on camera we see you sitting right there we got four or five witnesses that says such and such is right there and, and you talk about that and you describe the, the whole scenario the way it exactly happened then you got to deal with that that's that come, that's that's just the reality of what's happening. So let me say, the reason why I hear what you're saying, and, and, and I asked the question as devil's advocate, because I know you're not saying go lock up anybody because of their lyrics, but that's what some people want to say. But that's not the point. I was um, talking to someone I love. I won't say who they are, because I don't want to expose that person. And they said, you know, they, they love jury duty. Uh, they just love to go to jury duty. And they love the grand jury. That's their soft spot of what they, you know, they they are okay with being because this particular person was on a grand jury impanelment or impanel something. He he was impaneled for a grand jury for over a year because they were just seeing cases, one behind the next, one behind the next, handing down indictments or not. And one day he told me that, you know. He said, I go to jury duty because in the movement, he heard people say, make sure you go to jury duty if you want to, you know, be a steward of the movement and make sure you're protecting the rights of young black and brown people. And he said, I want to see justice. He was going to jury duty to make sure that if they bought some bullshit, he would be the one person in the room that said, hell no, we won't go. He was ready. That was his thing he said the facebook and the instagram was the number one thing that they would bring in and show you the word what people the messages the fights back and forth the words they were using the um you know the 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 the, the guys or, or girls they became artists some kind of way in the process and he couldn't even help he could not even stand in the way because the situations were so clear as day that when, the, and, and these were federal indictments, that when they were bringing these cases, he couldn't even say, you know, no, I see something here, or discrepancy here or bring nothing. It was clear. Yeah, they, they, they wrote about it. They took pictures of it. They showed where they was, how they was, everything they did. The girls was talking on social media with their friends about how he, my man getting money and this is going on and that's going on. He said it was very, you know, he, he, he was able to help with a few, but more than likely or more likely than not, and in more times than few, they sent people to prison. And it's, it's, it's self-incrimination, man. So I, 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 listen, I'm all for justice and I don't, I literally, hate to see people go to jail. I, I spent seven years of my life in prison. I know some of my friends who were not never coming home for $10 crimes, who then 20 something years for $10 crimes and things like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of the injustice that this system does, but I cannot, as a man of honor and principle and integrity, act like you telling on yourself and, and putting, you know, um, putting pertinent information from crimes that you know were committed or that you were engaged in or involved in or or know people that was involved in into music makes sense you know and and, and yeah. you think that and you and you blame anybody but yourself if if you're blaming anybody but yourself i i can't help you i, I can't help you with that you know i it's there's nothing i can do for you i want to be the advocate mm -hmm. i'm anti-prison i want to be forget the system the system is all broke i want to make sure all this but when you self-incriminate yourself and you give these people evidence in in all of the things they have to put you in prison and to take away your freedom then you have to figure out how you deal with that 
that's a that's a conscious decision as a man you we we watch numerous cases and numerous situations with social media and people in in, in uh putting out their business in situations and they talk about real situations in music and we've seen how it's been used against them and if you continue to do that then you've made a conscious decision that you want to go to jail and, and respectfully i gotta i gotta respect your decision as a man or a woman I hear that. I mean, it's a fine line because we want to make sure, though, that, um, you know, whatever Miss Fanny Willis is doing is right. And we don't know. You know, we, we have no idea of knowing. I don't know what she's doing, but I know what she said made 100 percent sense. I don't know exactly what's going on. But when she says, if you're rapping about crimes that actually happen, and we have evidence that shows that these crimes happen and we can put you involved in those crimes and you rapping about it, we are definitely going to utilize those songs as evidence. And that made 100% sense to me. Yeah, well, God bless. It's a lot. And I mean, some of the charges and the time that some of these people are looking at is real serious. So, real serious. No, I, well, I, I, you know, I- They are my prayers. And I don't, once again, I don't wish jail on anybody, but I cannot, I cannot sit here and act like I'm going to support ignorance and stupidity. I'm, I'm going to, you know, it's not like you don't know. When, when they're telling you and you're constantly doing it, then that means you've made a conscious decision that you just don't care. You're willing to deal with those consequences. Well, speaking of ignorance and stupidity, let's get into our topic because we got to bring our guests on. Um, and my thought of the day is directly connected, so I'm just going to merge it all together. I was reading on one of our blog sites, one of the blog sites, uh, that the woman in California who drove her car into the gas station and I guess 90 miles an hour speed and killed, I think, five people and injured others, um, that she may have lost consciousness while driving. There seems to have been, well, at some point there was a report and you got to be real careful because a lot of times you read comments online and then start repeating it as fact, right? And that's very dangerous. And we're all guilty of it, yeah. all guilty of it. Because at some point they said that she had had 12 or 13 other accidents before this incident took place that day. And um, I, I, so I started digging and looking. I couldn't find anywhere where that was substantiated. And in fact, I saw people debating back and forth where someone was saying that's 100% not true. I, so it may be, it may not be, but let's just isolate that, right? If we find out that that's absolutely the truth, that she had 13 other traffic violations, moving violations, we're going to have to reintroduce that and, and, and discuss this again. But let's just, since we don't know, we're isolating it to what happened that day. When watching that video, and again, I don't like watching videos of tragedy, but this particular situation could have been any one of us at that intersection, going to the gas station, driving, pulled over, coming through, whatever, and walking, walking to the store. This lady, when I saw it, I had to keep watching it because I was literally trying to get in the car and understand what in the hell was going on in the moments before this. Someone else that I do trust, but I still have not verified it, said that she was at work earlier that day and was not doing well mentally. And so they let her go home for some like mental health break, her, her job, right? They released her that day and let her go home. And she has this terrible, horrific moment where she took people's lives. When I saw that it's possible that she lost consciousness, right? And again, there are Black people that she killed. So folks can't say, oh, you don't care because it wasn't your people. And I don't know. I think the whole thing is terrible, horrific, awful, the worst thing. Oh my God, right? But I'm looking at this woman in the court, this little, you know, looked like she could have been a sweet little lady. And then this lady writes on, on one of these social networks, the situation about her getting released to go home. And I'm thinking to myself, 
something else is going on here that we don't understand. Something, something. There's, there's got to be a layer. They said it was she was mad at a boyfriend. And damn it, I know all about it because I've been so mad in my life at a man that I have done and have thought of doing the craziest shit to try to get the, the, the attention of how something is hurting or bothering me. But that, what she did was extreme, extreme, extreme. And so what I was thinking to myself is, if the job let her go, even if she had been having previous issues, and if she potentially lost consciousness, what, where is the help? Like, what, what are we doing to try to prevent these situations? Yeah, I know that what they say, the devil can just get in you. So I know that can happen. But something more here, and I feel like our healthcare system in this country is failing us so bad that I ask myself every day, is America literally killing us? Like literally, I'm not talking about, oh, you got into it with the police. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about like going, like you literally are being neglected for your mind to where you can't, your mind and your body may be counteracting something is wrong i feel the same way i've always you know i've always been critical about the way the 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 health system acts I, I, a couple of weeks ago you know i talked about how most men don't even like going to the doctor you know that was last I, week was actually. it last week okay well it was last week no uh, yes it was last week okay okay maybe it was like whatever i know i spoke about it and um i was very I critical you have to do your physical. And I've been very critical about the way that they handled the COVID situation, you know, about the way every time people go on a doctor, my friend, Fred the Godson, you know, his his um woman explained to me how when he before he went to the hospital, he was healthier than he was when he got there, and how there were many steps that after him getting there that she didn't understand, that didn't even make sense. That you know, and ultimately he he his life was lost inside the hospital. There was a lot of people saying don't go to the hospital because they feel like people was killing them. There was a lot of things, you know, and I always felt felt like I was gonna fight regardless of my own. I was gonna make myself healthy, I was gonna do all those things. And I say that to say, you know, there is in capitalism and in, in the health system, there is value in in, in us being unhealthy. You understand what I'm saying? There's, there's value in keeping you unhealthy. There's value in things that literally keep you to be dependent on the drugs that they sell. And Big Pharma needs people to need these drugs. They need you to write prescriptions. They need you to come in there. And, you know, and, and I'm very critical of that. I, I, I believe that wholeheartedly, just like the jails need to be filled. So they need to continue to have criteria for crimes that don't make sense. They need to continue to lock people up. You don't think the same way they have judges who was selling, you know, kids for for pay that they they have they they're selling our lives to for to these um pharmaceutical companies. You don't think that there are doctors and, and hospitals that are directly in tune with these people saying we're going to make sure that we we make this many prescriptions a year to make sure that you make this amount of money dis despite what it is or not we just going to classify and, and, and it's killing us literally so that's just my and if you don't have the best health insurance and you're not the best doctors and and, and and just think about that right just think about health and your insurance in the level of insurance that you have determine determines the quality of service that you get in a health clinic. This ain't a pair of sneakers or I'm gonna get a pair of shirt and the most expensive, I'm gonna get silk. This is people that you are going to literally that's supposed to be saving your life because they can. And the, the service that you get and, the, and, and the, the, the higher quality of life that you get or they tell you about how to save your life depends on how much money you have. That is crazy to me. I can, the fact that I can't go to the regular Harlem hospital and get the service that I can get downtown because I don't have insurance from a millionaire and a billionaire insurance that assures that they're going to try to extend my life tells me that the health insurance ain't really about me. It's about how much money you make. Well, but you know what? 
you could go to Harlem Hospital and get some good service if you have the right insurance. When you, it is, there is, let me tell you, the disparities and the racism within the healthcare system, okay, to be clear, it is blatant. It's bold. You can, they tell you stories. We learn stories all the time. People go to the hospital, they put a group over here and a group over there. They deal with some people one way and others a different way. And we know folks who have told us the story of how their loved ones were treated. Uh, listen, Michelle Obama, in, in, in one of these shows that, you know, they reenact her life, uh, it's, I think it's the President's Wives or something like that. There's a show that it, 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 uh, it covers um, the first Michelle wife, Obama, first, the first, first ladies, first, first ladies. ladies. It's Michelle, you know, there's, obviously it's not her, it's Viola Davis, but it's Michelle Obama, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, and somebody else, Betty Ford. Betty Ford. And they cover their lives. There is a whole part that shows how Michelle was trying to help her parents get insurance that her father died just because he didn't have the necessary insurance to take care of whatever issues. I think he had cancer or something, you know? So this is, this is the first lady now. Now she is. But when she was Michelle growing up in Chicago, she wasn't the first lady. They didn't have that type of insurance and the system screwed her father and he died. Okay. So I'm just thinking, you, first of all, physically, look, I keep talking about, I went to go to get my physical. Well, Hey, I learned some things when I went that 42 year olds ain't 38, 39, ain't 37. I'm 42. There's some things that's different. It's some issues there. I got to watch certain things that I'm eating. I got to look at the levels. I have to make go back in six months to take some more blood work, to check on making sure that my cholesterol is under control, that, you know, different things that is happening because of how we eat on the road and whatever. But we do have insurance and we try to take care of ourselves. We're active. We're moving. If you live in a housing projects in the South Bronx and you have and I'm not even going to say Medicaid because some people getting some good services with Medicaid. If you know how to maneuver the system, you can actually use it. And it does. And there's some benefits to it if you know how to use it. And that's the thing. Research matters. You can't sit home and just go wherever they tell you. You got to find out where do people who have Medicaid, who've done their research go to get their care? Because guess what? There's some folks that come from other races, and I'm not even going to just say white. It's a lot of other races that come here and they get Medicaid and they take it and use it in places and pockets and get themselves services that they need. But if you don't know it and if you don't have certain things, you if you having a if you having a physical thing, you might be able to get some. But if you having a mental health crisis, who who gonna help you? What are they gonna do for you? They might you might see a person here or there, but half the time, and this is a a thousand percent and i'm done with this point to be very clear most of the time because i know i was on welfare public assistance can nobody tell me about chick because i know i had ebt i had my picture i was i was on uh, medic i mean i was on welfare at the time when there was no picture on your card all the way to where they put your image on the card. What I know from going inside of these, these offices, even going to the doctor's office with insurance for my job with, later on, half the time the people you're talking to, they need help. Something, they is something wrong with them. They you're trying to get some help. They grinning, laughing, they got an attitude, they don't like their job, they don't want to deal with you. So a man, for the most part, women, we might fight our way through, but a man who shows up at the doctor's office and dealing with some idiot that's not even trying to really help them and doesn't even care about, they're not going back. They're gonna go home and patch it up and do whatever they're gonna do and keep it moving. And next thing you know, they stage four, they stay this, that, and the third, and, and on their way out. It's a disaster. They ain't got no water in Jackson. You can't get health care the way you need to. It's just too many things going on. And I'm just like, yo, I don't know. I don't know. We need something all the way different. All the way different. We want to ask our listeners, do y'all think that the health care system is killing us, literally? Do you think that it's efficient? Do, like, what are your experiences? Give. We want to get some feedback from you because 
from my my experience and what I've watched, you know, my mother was suffering for cancer for two years, and you know, there was periods of time where I thought there was healthcare, but then there was periods of time where I figured I felt that there was just them giving her medication that they know wasn't healing. I, I felt like that I, there was a time before when she first was diagnosed with cancer, she was so healthy still and she was fighting. And it's like the more medication, the more services they did, it was like they was taking life out of us. So I don't know, you know, everybody has a different experience. So I want to hear y'all experience. What do y'all think about America's healthcare system? Well, we got a guest coming up who certainly has been in contact with healthcare and um, I want to hear what she has to say. So let's bring her on. So, you you know, the last few weeks, my son, see, because, you know, people will say all they do is invite their friends to come up there and talk. But nope. <laughs> For the last few weeks, we've been having guests that are have become friends and are joining the Street Politicians family. And today I am particularly fangirl because our guest um, is someone who I admire uh, and someone who, as I was going down the rabbit hole of looking at Instagram, she became a sibling to me. Forget about friends, my sister, because she also loves the Lord. And you know, anybody that I can find that loves the Lord, like I do and understands the power of what God can do uh, for me, that, that just becomes family. And so Today, we're going to learn uh, so much about our sister, Keisha Green. Um, and Keisha, amazing Keisha Green. The amazing Keisha Green. On August 23rd, this past August, August. it'd be nine years of her ampu, ampuversity, um, wait, ant, mm. ampuversary, um, which means that she is an amputee uh, after an accident that happened nine years ago where she lost her legs. Uh, and she is actually celebrating. And that's something we're going to talk about, right? In quotes, what does it mean to celebrate such a tragedy? Because there's so many people, even with less, we can't celebrate. We said we broke down, you know, mentally, emotionally. Um, she has a foundation called Loving Legs Foundation, which is helping younger women who are amputees to connect with more seasoned women uh, who can help them through their journey. Uh, but the thing that I know I'm excited about, this 39-year-old woman is known as the Legless Diva, the Legless Diva. That's her brand. Um, and you know I love divas on the Street Politician Show. So let's welcome our sister, Keisha Green uh, to come in and join us on Street Politicians. Thank you so much for being with us, sis. No, thank you all so much for having me over here with you guys, because guess what? Now I'm your friend. I'm family. I'm here. Um, you guys never seen me here before, but I'm here now. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. And, you know, your story is motivating. It's amazing. Looking at you, like, you know how they say you don't look like what you've been through? You know, you definitely are a diva, beautiful black queen, and um, and we're just blessed to have you and just have you in this energy and spirit that you come in. Yes. Um, you know, because I was going to ask you to talk about the beginning and even me, you know, understanding the nuances of our lives, you know, specifically as women, as black women, even in this moment, I almost said start at the beginning with the consideration only for you lose, having an accident and losing your legs. But actually there's a beginning before that. And we, I want you to talk about the beginning, the Keisha Green um, who had not been through an accident and then take us all the way to the tragedy that occurred. You know, when you said that, you said that not been through an accident. And every time I think about this, um, so August 23rd, 2013 is when, I would say that was more of like a rebirth. That's not when God started being faithful to me. So I, being from the number eight poverty city, Syracuse, New York, I survived so many things before this actually took place for me. And the biggest thing that God allowed me to survive was that I was able to, as a single parent with a uh, section eight voucher and EBT, I was able to bring my kids out of the number eight poverty city to Atlanta, Georgia, before this even happened. So that was an escape for me right there. That was God. 
God doing something major for me right there. People where I'm from, they don't just pick up and take their families and believe that God has greater for them because it is so poverty stricken and there's not really people to impart into you that there is more. It could be very difficult. So being that God had already brought me through so many things, being um, like I said, being the number eight poverty city, being outside in the streets and dealing with um, all those types of situations, I believe gave me the strength to be able to endure August the 23rd, because I knew the same God that brought me out of poverty would be the same God that was going to bring me through this situation. It's mm, amazing. So you have three sons and, and what ages are they? 23, mm -hmm. 20 and 16. Wow. So they were all alive, living, and thriving when this situation took place. So tell us about that day. Um, that day, I took my son to football practice. I remember it so clearly. He was on the field. I was like, boy, come on, because I got somewhere to go tonight. So I remember as we left there, I remember what I was wearing. I had lunch with my homegirl that day. And just really that night, Everything, it was a it was a normal, typical night. We went out downtown Atlanta, me, my cousin, and another friend of mine at the time. We had a good time. We were heading home. My passenger thought that I was going to hit the car in front of me. She grabbed the wheel. We went across all four lanes. The guardrail came through the engine block and severed my legs. So although they call me a bilateral amputee, I lost my legs immediately right in front of me. Mm. What does bilateral mean? Both. Mm. Uh, so you still... So so the girlfriend grabs the wheel because she thinks you're going to hit a car and you go through the guardrail and immediately you see your legs just cut off. Yep. And wow. And you've seen that while you, like, you visualized it. I'm woke. I'm woke because there was no pain. So they say normally if it's that um, severe and that serious that you don't necessarily feel pain. So on the left side, I'm an above knee. On the right side, I'm a below knee. And if I can give you any visual of it, so when the guardrail come through, it like curve, right? So it cut this one high and that one low, right? If it go diagonal. So it actually took my right leg and pinned it in the middle. Mm. So you know, like where your middle of your car is, so it pinned it in the middle. So I had no pain until they had to get the guardrail out of my right, out of my right leg. And mm. when it starts to cut it, the metal begins to burn. And that's when I began to um, scream. So that was when I first began to have pain. But originally, my cousin was in the back seat. I went to turn around to her, and my right leg, my left leg, flew up on the steering wheel. That's how I knew I had lost the leg. Wow. So how, what was that mentally like? When you seen that, what what did it what did it do to you? You mind? even remember that? Like, like I can remember it very like quick. But what I will say is, the favor of God has been so great upon me that I don't really have all of that descript um descriptions. He really just allowed me to keep the really really positive um nuggets out of it. So what I will tell you is that when they was hitting the car with the jaws of life to get me out, I kept hearing the Lord say, "Break every chain, Keisha. You don't hear the chains is falling." So in that case, and then I never seen anybody. I was blacked out. I felt them the firemen pick me up. I felt very light, so I knew both legs was gone. Um, when he picked me up, I never seen him. I never seen the inside of the um, EMT, the ambulance. All I remember hearing was them say, take her to Grady. I tell people that was Holy Spirit saying, you're on your way. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I heard them say, get off at this exit. That's Holy Spirit saying, you made it. Mm -hmm. I never seen anybody heard anything else outside of that the entire time until when I woke up three days later. When you wow. woke up three days later. So for three days you were out. Were you unconscious or just out? Of um, they, I guess, you know, they put me under heavy sedation. So mm -hmm. I was under heavy sedation for three days. So Did anyone else in the car get harmed? Yeah, so my cousin, she um broke her, just broke her collarbone and my passenger who grabbed the wheel, nothing happened to her. Wow. So what what was the process? Like when you woke up and you know you you realized what's happening, was there always this positivity or do where you sat where you did you go through any period of like depression? Like what like what was your process? Um, I love to hear other people tell it, but it was always positive. So from the time I woke up, like I told you, one thing I did know before they sedated me is I already knew that both the legs was gone because I did know that. Um, 
when I woke up, most of my family said, I was like, hey, what y'all doing crying? Like, we can't do this. And honest to God, I was like, listen, they was like, oh, trying to take pictures of me. I was like, man, I look crazy. Y'all need to bring me a flat on you. Y'all need to bring me some lashes. Y'all gonna put me on the internet like this. And so literally that's how I was. I, that's just how I woke up. I was like, well, oh, in, in the video that I watched, it, it seemed like very early on, you know, because you're, you're giving a timeline of the nine years in the process. And it seemed like you were saying, which I was seeing it through tears, that this is, you You were smiling even in the beginning when this that was- wasn't, That wasn't the nine years. That was like my first two months. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that was like my first two months. This is your nine year journey. And it's showing you, showing the beginning and you were literally smiling where, and I know, I know there are so many. So I believe- wholeheartedly that that smile and that joy of I'm alive I'm, I'm I'm still here came from your relationship and understanding of how powerful God is but people that don't know they they you know for them or they just might not believe they don't understand it so what what conversation are you having with yourself your family or whatever that's keeping you feeling like now with no legs you can still keep going now listen, I like to be transparent and real, so I'm not having no conversations with myself. I'm not having no conversation with my family. I never knew an amputee before me. My family don't know nothing about being an amputee. The only person that could tell me how to do this thing is Holy Spirit. Nobody know how to do this. Nobody around me to instruct me how to do this. So only God could give me directions on how to do this. So what I will tell people is what made it a little easier is that the three days that they say, they say, I spent on a respirator, have you? I spent two of those days with the Lord. He told me the legs that you have was not strong enough to walk into the territory that I have for you. Mm -hmm. So I literally was able and literally like knowing that he's literally like you're going on assignment because I'm literally at the gates. I'm with the father. And he's mm -hmm. like, you're going on assignment. The legs you have was not strong enough to walk into the territory that I have for you. I held that thing. Because if you really dissect it, it says, all you was doing this entire time was standing in your own way. The legs you had couldn't even take you where we about to go. But he said the territory. Mm -hmm. Territory, that's mm -hmm. huge. That sounds like nations, mm -hmm. masses. There's people waiting for you right in this circumstance, the exact way you stand right now that need you. Go forth. Mm -hmm. Lord have mercy. So that's, that's powerful in itself. You know, so as I as I, I pay attention to you and, and just looking at you, right? Like I said before, you don't look like what you've been through. Nobody, you look, you have this glow, like that's amazing that most people who've never been through what you've been through even have. And I know, and, and I'm just and going through your Instagram, I see a lot of hate. I see some people acting like you shouldn't be this happy. You shouldn't have this much power. Like, how do you take that? Well, what I've been able to do with that is to understand that people have a way of being able to accept pity from me over power. Mm. And the power that comes from me, they'd rather it be pity because the power that comes from me actually also convicts them, right? Mm. So there's one or two things that happens when you embrace me. You're either empowered by me and inspired by me. Well, excuse me, three things. You're either empowered, inspired, or you're convicted, mm. right? So those that are convicted, conviction comes forth in anger. So now you're the problem because you're exposing to me the problems within me. Mm. And so I'm able to recognize that. So I know what it is. I'll be like, oh, they believe mm. You know, that is it's so powerful because in every situation we can find, if we're true believers, ways in which God shows up the same for, mm -hmm. for, for many of us. And so with me as an, as an activist, organizer who some people feel as a leader i think people like the pity side as well they want me to look beat down beg for you know resources they want to see you know somebody was upset with my song why is your cash app 
in your bio? Well, because every day people ask him that actually do want to support him. Yeah. How can I support you? And if they can't get to you when they ready to give $20, $200, $500, then, then you know, you might miss them until next time. Right. So right there, you can support me and people actually do it all the time for him. But the same thing with me, it's like, the fact that, yeah, God did, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about the work that I'm doing, but I also am a great speaker. Sometimes I'm a great speaker. Um, I'm a writer. I have other skills and people pay me for it. And if I want to doll myself up and get my makeup done and feel good about myself and I don't want to stay at the Roach Motel because I'm not, because I'm not. not you know, because I'm not period at all. You know, I'm going to be as comfortable as possible as I travel the world. And it's sad because it seems as if the way that people see me as being most authentic is in the most broken state, but the powerful place is hard for them to digest. So what does, does it make you, what does it make you do go harder or like, how do you, because to, to have a bold name, like the legless diva, in and of itself makes people feel like, oh, what's that supposed to mean? I hope it make them feel like I'm getting ready to wake up every day and slay without a shoe game because that's what I'm going to do. Mm. <laughs> right. yeah, so that's what they should be expecting when they hear that. But it's funny, everything what you're saying is so true. So I think I had a post a few weeks ago. The lady was like, oh, it looked like to me, like she um rolling around on charity. I'm like, girl, I disqualify myself from disability. What are you talking about? Because mm -hmm. it wasn't disability. It was limiting my ability because the ability of my mind is stronger than any disability of my physical body. So that's not going to stop me. So I think it's mind blown again. It really makes people reflect and look at their self. So what I realize is this, right? We talked about earlier. Your image, right? This is what God gave me because I battled with that. You know, even people saying, um, you, girl, you be fly every day, every time I see you, you know that the human mind can start to take that and we can start to say, well, am I doing too much, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They be like, every time I see you and you'll start to like battle with yourself, am I doing too much? Do I need to calm down? Let me tell you, I went through that a few weeks ago at Kingdom University and the Lord spoke these words to me. He said, daughter, your appearance is a presentation that protects your power and prevents pity. Mm, prevents mm. pity and mm. when he said that to me he was like be be fly all the time be fly everywhere you go because you know why because you know why when people see me rolling up they already know it's not pity because my appearance has already let you know that my stance is powerful and i'm about me mm. so mm. i'm just not gonna do that for them mm. so we want i want to know i know i see that your son's seem like they are your rocks like you know they they love you they take care of you you know so are they the main people that take care of you or like what is help the me. process mm -hmm. of help like do you do a lot of things on your own do you want nobody like how does that happen mm -hmm. all right so my boys they help me out around the house they not they're just regular children and another thing is that you know, even when you say that and whoever's listening to this I'm going to just put this out here because I feel led in my spirit um, my situation is not my boy's circumstances for them to carry. Mm. So I was telling somebody this morning, like, yo, y'all got to stop dating your sons. Mm. No, that's not my husband. They're not my husband. They're not my man or anything like that. So I don't place like super heavy burdens on them. Like they responsible for me. I pretty much do my own thing. I drive with hand controls. I run four or five businesses. Um, every day I get up, you know, I am called to build um, affordable, accessible housing. That's going to be my next thing that I'm going to be breaking ground on in May. So I'm able to architecturally get through my house, do everything that I need, um, nothing in a way. So I pretty much take care of myself. I have my team, my staff. They don't take care of me. They take care of my business. Mm. So you take care of yourself. My mom lost access to the left side. Um, with uh, you know, lost a lot of mobility with a stroke. And the thing that I realized is that balance of having two hands is something that actually impact, cause she's ready to go, you know, but she's held back a lot by the fact that she doesn't have balance with her arm and her leg on the left side. 
but you have balance at the top of your body. So I guess that I'm, I'm just assuming, I mean, I'm asking a real naive question. Is that what helps you to be able to take care of most things on your own? Well, I would say because I'm 100% healthy. I don't have no health issues. I don't take no medication. Like everything about me, I'm gonna have a baby. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you got the man to have a baby with, or you got? Yeah, I just don't work. We don't need that. <laughs> already spoken Get out of God's business. Get out of God's. <laughs> business. Okay, all right, Get all right. Get out of right. God's business. We got this. So literally, no, everything about me, I could do for myself. Um, I'm a hundred percent healthy. I'm strong. To God be the glory. He's kept me. Like there's nothing. Um, that's keeping me from being able to take care of myself. I hop over and literally, you know, I bust my chair. I got a chair that I put in the passenger seat. I got one that I keep in the trunk. But being here gives me a level of humility too. Mm -hmm. So you're asking me, do I have a problem with asking people for help? Absolutely not. I got a chair. I'll put it in the trunk. I'll go wherever I want to go. I so you use out. the prosthetic legs at that time? Because you don't really use those. But I, don't use I those. saw in the video, you have them. I haven't used those since 2018. That's not for me. Why? You know, I work with amputee women, so I understand the use of them and why people care for them. But for me, I know it would have been a trick of the enemy to blend in. And God said, don't blend in. He need the people to see me for his glory. I don't want to mm. do that. It's nothing fake about me. I don't want to be a robot. I want to be me. Mm. wow so you do it so you don't I love the authenticity them. i just love the authenticity yeah you say you're this woman is completely who she is she's unapologetically who she is you can take her or leave her and she has no problem <laughs> <laughs> she love her so much she don't even care what you think that's that's what life is so you don't wear the prosthetic legs, which for people who are listening, we can't assume that folks know it would be art like artificial legs right. that would have been fit to you and you know, and all of that. You have them, but you don't wear them so that you can be a beacon of light. Like people can look right at you and see that it's possible without the legs to get around and do what you oh, have. Yeah. So many people message me, they be like, I didn't want to wear that leg. And if you the reason why I took it off, like I never wanted to wear that. People need to be inspired in all different directions. Some people don't want to do that because with that, for me, I didn't want to do it because I come from a family of pain pill um, addiction, right? So a lot of people who walk in them, it come with a lot of pain. It come with a lot of endurance. Another thing that was a battle for me is that a lot of people I know that wear them, their, their personal limbs up under them is like worn beat down, torn. So another thing I started saying is, you mean to tell me I want to walk around in something artificial all day to the fact where I got to go home, take it off, and I can't love me, the me? Mm. Because it's not, mm -mm, girl, no, I'm real cute. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'm real cute. I'd be like, no. <laughs> if you lost one leg, of course you want to wear a prosthetic. You want to walk. It just makes more sense, you know, for those who lost one limb. I lost both, so I could just pretty much sit here. And in regards to your mom with the stroke, I don't know if you guys noticed, like, when I laugh, I've been struggling with Bell's palsy. So I feel back in April, I thought I had a stroke because I've been struggling with Bell's palsy. So, like, this left side of my um, face had really stopped working on me. So that was a, that was more of a struggle for me. I was like, hold on, guy. Now, I already ain't got no legs. Don't play with me. <laughs> you got to keep me real cute in the face. So that was really hard for me dealing with that and the healing of it. And it really had strong stroke effects. So like my speech was very slurry. Um, my face couldn't move. So I definitely get it. And um, I didn't want to go through the therapy part. I just thought that if I did the prosthetics, I felt like that was the giving the enemy too much space in my mind. Mm. make me think that that's what I needed in order to move so now I gotta go here three times a week you want me to put these prosthetics on so everywhere I go I'm paying attention to how I'm walking if I'm a fall I'm distracted from real life mm. so I just felt for me I could do way more with my focus and with my brain space than to be worried about that I walked for 30 years I ain't missing nothing I already did it so okay. give us some insights into the businesses. You said you, you were in five businesses. What are those businesses that you... Okay, so I built some last suites. That's one thing that I do. And I started doing that because a lot of the services that I was getting before the accident 
um, I could no longer go to those places of service. I realized they had steps, different things like that. I was like, okay. So I, I, I end up doing that, but I also run the Love and Legs Foundation, the legless and wheelchair diva community where I bring women together. I'm also getting ready to launch the Push Collection, which is a amputee influenced um, boutique. All the models are beautiful, beautiful Black amputee women that are truly doing their thing. And um, that's absolutely amazing. Um, I'm no longer part of that business, but I used to be in network marketing with Total Life Changes. I created the Nutriverse vending machine. Mm. Um, so I was able to uh, crack their code of it taking a team to do six figures. I was able to do six figures through vending machines. Um, God strategically gave me that strategy for that. And I'm getting ready to launch Nothing Missing. Nothing Missing is also a, pot, a vodcast um, platform of amputee women. And it's called Nothing Missing. I'm missing both legs. My co-host is missing both arms. And my other co-host is missing one leg. And it's called Nothing Missing. Mm. Mm. So those are the three women that I, I saw you and two other women in a couple of posts. Okay, so so I, it doesn't seem that the one person is missing a leg. Mm -hmm. So she must use the prosthetic. Yes, leg. she does. Okay. So it works for some and not for others. Yeah. So the young women that you work with at Love and Legs Foundation, they can call and sign up for free. Yeah. So there's a link in my bio to say sign up for the Love and Legs Foundation. It's free. It's a meeting platform. We connect, collaborate, inspire each other. Um, it gives you a space to be relatable, but also we give you tools to boss with the ability that you do have. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Listen, man. We, we probably could do this interview all day. We need a whole like we need a, like a five hour sit down. Just to oh, no, I me that. before we let you go, because you, you you've been on for a while and we appreciate your candor steve harvey at some point was introduced to you tell us about how that happened and what was his impact in your life that was major i call him my uncle um i call him my uncle that was major i still stay in relationship with him he really changed me and my kids life so five months after the accident I was able to um, go on the Steve Harvey show. I literally just in the middle of the night, I was led to write like about five sentences, sent two pictures. They ended up calling me like immediately. What they did for me was they gave me and my boys a car because of course I lost the car in the accident and they connected me to my prosthetic center where I got the prosthesis from. Um, but there was something that he said to me, not what he gave me, what he said to me is what really changed my life. And he said, it's just been five months. And he just looked at me, he says, it's been five months. He said, you still got it. Mm. That, I ate that. I still eat it now, like Minna in the morning. Um, and when he said that to me, and me knowing who he is and who I see him to be, it was almost like one of those things where I was like, I don't care what nobody else saying. Cause I know what he just said to me, like, you know who that is? I was like, man, can you see Harvey said I still got it? I still got it. Well, you like, still got it, baby. <laughs> you still got it. You got it. You got it. I, don't, I don't know you had it before, but you got it now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I wasn't there before, but right now. That's right. Got, so some got. people say you still got it, but you caught it. You said, now you got it. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> Stay still, because I wasn't there, but I know right now you got it, Queen. And, and it's a blessing to just get energy for because you know a lot of times we need fuel i said this today we need fuel so when you see somebody that has this level of energy authenticity and that loves themselves like you tell yourself look man i gotta I, this one look i'm in competition like i gotta love me the way you love you Come you know on. what i'm saying that's what it is for me i don't see it as nothing about anybody that got something negative to say about you we just got to send them blessings man say god bless you yeah. give them a hug they need a hug absolutely we gotta be able to know they bleed it you know, yeah. people are hurting silently in so many different places and you never know what triggers it. Yeah. You know? So sometimes if you sat for a whole week and felt pitiful about yourself and then you see somebody like me, it make you feel bad about what you just did. So we just kind of- I don't know about that. It motivates me to see somebody like you. If I was, if I was pitiful for a whole week, and I got on here and seen a beautiful woman like you with this energy that's been through what you've been through, thriving, surviving, living, and winning. I'm gonna say, listen, I got to get up and go win. So thank you for giving we, me. We we never asked about our topic. 
<laughs> oh yeah, I would top it. Go ahead, you ask. Before you go, and I know we said that three times, so my oh, apologies, but it's so much. Like you're just so full of truth, mm -hmm. um, and knowledge, and power, mm -hmm. and Ooh. I don't know. There's some other stuff, you know. I feel like. You're one of those people, sometimes when we're talking to our folks that are teaching us about financial literacy and, and financial freedom, I always say, I'm going to call you when this is over so we can talk some more because I need some personal <laughs> to help. Uh, and I feel like that about you, uh, that we need to talk offline just so that I can be inspired. How is it that I walking around full, you know, I got all my limbs in place, but I need some encouragement from you just about how to keep putting one foot in front of the other, you know, just keep going. Like sometimes you just feel like you just want to sit down and stop because there's so much, but there's so much more to, um, to look, to not so much look forward to, but there's so much to hold on to, you know, you got your kids, you got your life. There's a whole world happening around you. And we letting this one or two little things just just take everything down. And and, yes. and that's it. You go ahead. Go ahead. But you yourself are so amazing. I'm so inspired by you. I think you are so phenomenal, such a pillar um, for the community. And people are watching regardless. I know people are watching you because who you are, but there's people who's watching that you don't even know. And so you said, as far as um, me encouraging you, I do want to give you this because as you were speaking, I don't know, I think you probably noticed. I was like, look over. Holy Spirit started speaking to me. I started looking over. So I started looking over. Um, one of the things is that caught me very early on last year. And what I want to give you as an encouragement, and I'm going to say it right here, is that I want to commit to um, the next time that you go out and you're doing anything, how you're going to put one foot in front of the other is because I'm going to roll next to you. Mm. One yeah. foot. And then you roll. I mean, that's what well, it listen, takes. You got to walk it out and I'm going to roll with it. Mm. Walk it out. Walk it out. Walk it out. <laughs> that's what I'm Girl, I'm telling you, <laughs> don't get me to shout it because I will get up and run from one side back to the yeah. next in here. You know, I don't, girl. You just, but that's how we do it. We had a topic today. Yeah. We'll never, topic? ever yeah. get you off the head if we don't get to the topic. Okay, let's do it. Before and after, right? We've been we've been talking about, I wouldn't say debating, but talking about the healthcare system in America. And the question that we're asking is, is America killing us as Black people, right? Before and after your situation, I don't even know. I mean, yes, it's a tragedy, but we got to find new titles and new ways of describing things. We do. What do you think about America's healthcare system? Do you think you got what you needed? Do you feel like look look at your face? Was it was was it was it like really a disaster? And you had to maneuver around and find ways. Like talk about your experience and what would you say to a young amputee that's sitting there right now? Like you know, I can't even get the things I need to stay healthy, even though I'm I'm fighting this battle. Well, what I would say is I definitely myself, those were some of the things that point um actually pushed me in the beginning is when I came home, I couldn't get in my bathroom. I still had, um, my house has tons and tons of stairs. They didn't send me home with a wheelchair, a bedside. Like I couldn't get in my bathroom, take a shower, like none of those types of things. So that's another thing, the Love and Lakes Foundation, we provide accessibility items for the third world countries, like wheelchairs, mm -hmm. walkers, canes, and different things like that. Because you know, a lot of people don't know this, but amputees in foreign countries, they like build carts. Like they'll get a piece of wood, put some wheels on the bottom of it, and they be going like this. Like, so people have no clue, like the lack of resources when it comes to medical. So for me, they definitely didn't do me right. But what I can encourage someone to do is you got to be your own resource. Like you got to use the ability that you do have, because let me tell you, sorrow don't slide you to the front mm -hmm. and empathy is limited. Mm -hmm. And so with that being said, if you have your right mind and you're in position right now to hear this, you can articulate what I'm saying. 
I would tell you to grab onto something, get you a coach, get you a book. You got to get ready to set up the legacy for yourself. I don't think America care nothing about us and what we going to have and what they want to give to us. Another thing is, I remember trying to sign up for an insurance after my accident. It was called a critical health insurance. So it's like for if you get cancer or something like that, um, you know what they told me? I'm already critically ill. So, <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> so that's it. Like, you know, but I, that's not what I heard though when they said that. That's not what I heard because it's all up to the way that you allow your mind to hear and the way that you think. What they said is you better insure yourself. Mm. You better insure yourself. That's what I heard. So it's all what you decide to allow your ear gate to do is what you receive from what people are saying. So they ain't hurt my feelings. They told me, girl, you better insure yourself. Mm. So I would just encourage you to grab onto something. Just know that all is not lost. And if you have the ability to think, you have the ability to create. And I will encourage you to. Well, with that said, Queen, keep creating, keep inspiring, motivating. The legless diva is amazing. You know, I listen, I, I look forward to continue to build with you to see the things that you're going to do in the future because it just started. man. Yeah, it did. Don't forget the words that I spoke. Hold on to them. I'm going to DM you my number. And um, this is not the last time that I will see you guys. Where, where can they find you at? What is your website, your page? What? KeishaGreen.com and it's at I am Keisha Green. I'm Keisha Green on all platforms. You can Google the legless diva. I should come up as well. Y'all got to bring me back. Yes, we got to bring me back. Do. I, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to be walking and you're going to be rolling next to me. And I'm ready I'm to be, get I'm it. Walking on the other side. keep walking because I'm going to roll with it. You're going to roll I'm with it. On the other side. That's walk right. it out. Walk it out. Walk it out. <laughs> you're going to be burning calories and I'm going to be burning the battery. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> you got bar, she got bars, my she got you bars. Put on the track. Put her on the track. Put you on some. <laughs> we, we love, admire, and adore you. This Thank is our new friend. So our new friend. Our new friend. We got a new friend. Yeah. You Green. Thank you for joining us. No, thank you guys so much later. Bye. Listen, Keisha Green is amazing. And she's fly. She's fine. She's a black queen. She got energy. She got all the stuff you're looking for. I don't know how she's single, but we're going to say somebody. God, said stay out God's business. That's, the, that's God's business. She ain't got Well, nothing. what she said to me offline was when it's right it's right so when it's going when it's right she's gonna be ready she okay. getting ready well shout out to her man amazing she is damn i'm so inspired i'm pumped up i, I got stuff to do i'm, I'm about to work out up. i got rhymes to write i got like i got whole type of shit i got i got shit to do man it's good it, it's good when you have people who have energy that's contagious right that mm -hmm. that inspires you and motivates you and as soon as she got on this camera you know, and I was like, oh, this, we have an amputee. I was thinking that, you know, we got to deal with her. You know, it's a lot she's probably dealing with. That lady was, she came in here with this energy, a smile that lit up the room, like all types of stuff. So I just want to say thank you for inspiring and motivating us, Keisha, today. And you, and you know what? You have people who are stupid. Who stupid is it? Yeah. Stupid, you could say. I'm going to still use stupid. If they decide that stupid is something wrong with stupid, I'm just going to be, I'm going to have to be in trouble with the whoever don't like the stupid but stupid, but stupid, stupid works for me. I love the word stupid. It's, the only, it's a bet because I got other one. I got MFs and other things. So just let me say well, stupid let's... so that exactly. But with her, people will sit there who are also in her situation or other things and be mad like, well, why is she being celebrated? Most people don't have this and that. And she just happened to have an opportunity instead of being able to look at her and say, be let me go clear. harder. Let me go harder. Let me read more. Let me get up and move around and make decisions. Don't just let these people tell you, you got to wear the leg, you got to wear the arm, you got to do this. Or maybe if that's what you want to do, but you got to find ways to push. And that, and we have to have that conversation with ourselves every single day. We have to say, hey, 
let's go. Let's go. You know, sitting down is not, that ain't going to get you nowhere. Sitting down ain't going to get you nowhere but tired. You're going to be used to being tired and sitting down. And she said something that I say all the time. People are jealous of you or they hate you because they they you expose their own weakness, right? Your power exposes somebody's weakness. So your will to keep going, to never give up, to get up and go, they look and say, damn, I don't have that. Right. Or, or I don't want to utilize that. I haven't found that self in me. So I'm a, I hate that you have it. I hate that you won't give up. Why don't you just give up and fall to the waistline like everybody else does? And like, feel why? sorry for yourself. Yeah, feel sorry for yourself. Be mad. Why you continue to go on and persevere and overcome and 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 get and deny all the naysayers? Why you keep doing that? So, and that's what she and, and I know she deals with that because we all do. So, once again, I just want to say thank her and I appreciate her for the motivation, man. Mm -hmm. And now, with that said, it brings me to my I don't get it. So, you know, I watched this little, had this little video on my page today. And what, a, a guy that I know actually DM'd it to me. So I pretty, I think I was the first person to post police. It's, they're, they're arresting some guys it's in Harlem. You know, I found I was on 135th Street, I think it's 7th Avenue. And they're arresting some guys, a bunch of police officers, a white shirt, a bunch of black Hispanic police officers. And they got this black guy, young girl, you could tell she's young real slim runs out there and she's trying to see what's going on. So I guess she knows the guy and he's telling her something, probably telling her, you'll grip my stuff because it's on the floor. So she looks down and you can't really see what transpires much after that, but you can tell that she's pushed back because you see her go back. So then when she's pushed back, you know, her immediate reaction is that she swings, like she hits the officer on the arm, like pushes him back. And after this pushback, I don't know if the fist was closed. I don't know if it's open, but all I know is that this officer hit her with one of the hardest hits I've probably, I don't think I, I hit a man that hard in my life. And this lady hits, falls, young girl, cause I found out now that she's 19 years old, falls and hits her head on the ground. She's laying there. Everybody is screaming, why would you do that? And this officer, who's a black man, you know, just looks around and then proceeds to arrest the lady, you know, and I just don't, you know, and we, I'm going to constantly have this issue. I just don't get how we have public servants who are supposed to protect and serve us that seem to be initiating levels of violence and anger that even the civilians aren't doing. I just don't get, and, and I don't get how people are able to justify it. Oh, well, she shouldn't have been talking to the police. She, she should have never got involved in those things. And the more that I hear that, it really, I'm so much confused, man. I've been a man my whole life. I've been around women. You know, I've been around, I, I understand the law. I've studied law. You know, I used to go to John Jay. I went there for a year. I studied, I was incarcerated. I was in the law library, a lot of my bids. So I studied law, I understand the legal system. And I understand that the job and the duties of these public services of police officers are to not only uphold the law, it's to protect and serve civilians. They pretty much work for us, right? So when I watch them abuse this authority over and over and see how the community has become numb to it and starts to accept it, and then it's just, continue, it's, it's like, it, it's, it's sanctioned by the state and constantly over and over, I'm just really confused that what are we trying to do? Because I know as a man, as a son, as a brother, as a father, a, a husband, if you put your hands on any woman that's affiliated with me in that manner, I don't care if you're the police. At that point, you, you become the enemy to me and I'm going to react in that manner. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to react in that manner. And, and if that's what the police are trying to do, if you're trying to get complete, you know, division between the community and the police, keep doing it. I know it's not going to work. I know that it's going to be men that don't stand for it. I know there's going to be retaliations. And I, I don't know if they're paying attention to that. I don't know if the humanity in 
the, the you know the public servant office is gone or they really think that this is okay and it's going to continue to move like this i don't understand what they're trying to accomplish so i really just don't get it at this point i had another little like when I, I watched the video and actually it made my stomach hurt. This is why I don't watch the videos or I try not to as often as, as possible. But I think my perspective came in when I think about how people are like, we need more cops, right? And, and Joe Biden, uh, President Biden just recently announced, I think the night before, he announced these 100,000 new cops that they are um, adding to the police force. Mm -hmm. And what I saw in that video was a whole bunch of cops. I didn't see a, a, a police force that was scarce, where there was only two officers out there dealing with 50 people or 100 people. I didn't see a situation where uh, they're so understaffed that they didn't have enough people to help them contain the situation. And I promise you, because I, when you said you can't really tell what happens before, I saw very clearly her body jerk back and she reached and like hit the officer. Like, why did you hit me? Okay. There'll be some that. people, there'll be some people who will say she shouldn't have hit him. He shouldn't have hit her. It wasn't necessary. I bet you, I bet you if he would have turned around and said to her with respect, you got to, you know, ma'am, you got to move out the way because we come in this way. You got to move back. You got to move back because you can one thing, you know, from the video watching, you don't hear a ruckus and commotion between that officer. And that one, that young it, that's the problem. It, it happens in seconds, which tells me only because, you know, none of us know, but only because I have been in these situations too many times I've watched what happens. They don't give you in a lot of situations. I'm not saying all because to say all would be untrue. But in a lot of situations, they don't give you the respect of, hey, you know, can you back up? Because I'm coming this way. Get whatever you're going to get. You got to back up. You got to back up. Seems to me like he's aggressive off the bat. No matter what, though, even if she's 19 or 99, that woman's or physique is too small for that big man to hit her the way that he did. That's the fact. Should have never happened. It should have never happened. And I see different organizations calling for them to deal with it. I'm sure they're trying to figure out a way to explain well, and then this happened and that and the third, if they wanted to secure the perimeter, they should have done that. They should have done that. They should have had offices there, back up, secure the perimeter. But instead, and this is another problem that I noticed with these officers from even situations that I have personally been involved in, they get involved in the melee, like, you know, like they with the regular people. They don't necessarily maintain discipline enough to step back and try to get a view of what's going on and help everybody, including the public, to conduct themselves in a way. These people are arresting, folks being arrested. You see mamas coming out with their robe on. You know people are going to be all yelling, screaming. Where are the, Where is the tactical side of policing? Where is the tactical side? I mm -hmm. Oh, too often they lose it with it. Everybody's lost it. So what do you need to pay the police That's what I'm for? If I'm paying you to have the same reaction that me, an untrained citizen, have, why are you getting all this money? Why do we keep it? And when you say defund the police, people don't understand that mentality. Obviously, there are situations that these police officers are not qualified to engage in. There are I want to see a black office no i don't want to see this actually but metaphorically just to make the point i would like to see a black officer knock a white 19 year old girl in a affluent community where they fight cops because i have seen them doing more than what was going on in that video i have seen where i i have i have i have watched videos of people throwing, fighting, yelling, screaming, complete chaos 
And I have never, ever, 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 nobody, not even my trolls, because the trolls love to tell me, you know, we race, what do you call it? Race, race baiting. And then I, okay, send us the video. This is the, this is what I want today. That's what I want today. This is what we're going to open up the floor. So first you already said, we want to open it up for people to tell us about their experiences with the healthcare system and you know what they what they feel do they feel like they rather try to figure out how to take care of themselves at home or would they say especially after covid cuz some things which we talked about are working a little bit better it's funny like after covid there's some stuff the time that you could be in a doctor's office and in other places got cut down so you don't got people waiting you know all of the stuff that we already discussed when they go to the to the hospital or to the doctor's office, how do they feel about the system? We we also need to open it up for people to send us videos. We want videos, we want footage, prove us wrong, where black officers and others are hitting black women, I mean white women, arresting them, knocking them down to the floor, uh uh uh, uh hitting them in the way in which what we saw happen shooting and killing unarmed white men and boys, teenagers. I want to see it. There's been a few cases, of course, because the attorney Ben Crump and others have cases where there have been some um, white victims, but we know overwhelmingly where unjust killings happen. And we want to see, because y'all saying we race baiting. So send us the videos to show us similar incidents where we can find the types of things that happen in our community happen in the white folks and other communities, by the way. And other communities. I, I, listen, because I want to be educated. If I'm wrong, I'm going to say, Yo, you know what? I was wrong. So please send those videos, man, and, and, and prove us wrong. We can't wait. I can't wait to be wrong. And with that said, that brings us to the end of another amazing episode. Shout out to Keisha Green for her testimony, her energy, her glow that illuminated this show today. Make sure you follow her, support her in everything she does. If you need a little energy, get some from her because she got it. You know, like, like Steve Harvey says, she still got it. I said, I don't know if she still got it. I know she got it now. All so right. I want to say thank you to her and thank you to our listeners who make us number one, man. Number one. <laughs> Podcasts in the world, street politicians, baby. Yeah. We, we got ways people. to go to be number one. Listen, man, yeah. listen. You listen. See, Keisha, Keisha, you ain't listening to Keisha. Keisha I said he's know. already there. Don't please God. Stay out of God's business. It's God business. God done already made this the number one podcast. So we want to thank you in advance for making us the number one podcast in the world. I'm not gonna always be right. Tamika Mary's not gonna always be wrong, but we will both always, and I mean. Always be authentic. Listen to Street Politicians on the Black Effect Network on iHeartRadio. And catch us every single Wednesday for the video version of Street Politicians on iWomen.tv. 